Welcome everyone to the second of two sessions of the Carl Jasper Society of North America during the 93rd Pacific Division APA meeting in Vancouver on April 20th, 2019. So today's session is an author meets critics session on Trevor Shear's book, Hannah Arendt's Theory of Political Action, Daimonic Disclosure of the Who, where the author will respond to the critics presented by a panel of three. Dr. Trevor Cheer received his BA and MA from the University of Ottawa and his PhD at the University of Alberta. His areas of expertise are classical and modern history of political thought, moral philosophy, and RN's theory of political action, and Canadian political institutions. Cheer published his first book entitled Hannah Arendt's Theory of Political Action. His book focuses on Arendt's defense of political freedom, human dignity, and plurality in the face of totalitarianism, and offers a new interpretation of the theory of political action and identity. Cheer claims that Arendt's thought is more relevant than ever as a result of people grappling with the rise of populism and us versus them style politics. Arendt, claims Cheer, offers people an opportunity to defend the human rights of refugees, determine terms of political recognition that respect difference, offer political reconciliation, contest abuses of sovereign state power, protect public spaces and opportunities for meaningful citizen engagement, and offer deliberation across different perspectives in ways that might overcome violent conflict. I'd like to turn it now over to Dr. Cheer to give us a personal introduction to the book. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, first, let me extend a heartfelt thanks to the Carl Jasper Society of North America and in particular to Helmut Wouterscher for this wonderful invitation and for featuring my book this year. I also want to thank the uh, panel chair, Dane Sawyer, and the critics, uh, Frederick Dolan, Karen Fry, and Jennifer Gaffney. Um, I'd like to say a bit about how I came to write this book and how I came to work on Hannah Arendt and to intertwine with this story some brief explanations about uh, what the chapters of the book attempted to foreground. I grew up in Alberta, the province on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, and as a kid I went to Roman Catholic Church and French language Roman Catholic school and was baptized the Ukrainian Catholic. Uh, when I went off to university at 17 in Ottawa, I majored in political science and specialized in political theory, and of course had my whole worldview blown up by studying the Western canon of political thought, including its tradition of secular humanism. And while the faith of my childhood was seriously and forever altered, I remained fascinated by notions of the absolute, the transcendent in our political life. I was also interested in a related question about how people of different faiths, comprehensive doctrines, or moral hypergoods could peacefully, fairly, and meaningfully engage with each other in political deliberation. It was probably no accident then that I did my master's on Charles Taylor, a Canadian Catholic modern philosopher interested in a lot of the same questions. And through my study of Taylor, with the guidance of professors Kula Melos and Douglas Mogash at the University of Ottawa, I explored the sources of modern selfhood and a theory of identity steeped in the philosophy of Hegel, his account of concrete rational autonomy and his ethics of mutual recognition. Uh, in a master's course with Professor Melos appeared Hannah Arendt's chapter on action. I still remember reading it for the first time. What was this? It seemed to speak to all the main figures of the tradition, but to say something quite different uh, about the very phenomenology of political action, speech, and decentering of the self before others. I hadn't yet read Heidegger or Jaspers, so it was very new to me. Um, at the same time, I was studying under Professor Gilles Labelle, who had studied in Paris with Claude Lefort, part of a group of French political philosophers interested both in the question of whether um, there's a kind of permanence of theological categories in an, our politics, and the Arendtian and I think Machiave Machiavellian notion that there might exist a relatively autonomous sphere of the political. At the University of Alberta, I delved more deeply into the works of Marx during my PhD under the guidance of Professor Catherine Kellogg. But when it came time to identify a theme for my PhD thesis, she gently nudged me towards a rent account of political judgment based on a particular reading of Kant's aesthetic theory. Best of all, she examined eye-opening ways that the Greeks used arts metaphors both productive and performative arts to explain the nature and purposes of politics. 
this was exciting. Um, see, for me, for all the time I'd been studying politics and political theory, I'd also pursued a passion for music. I was and still am an uh, amateur singer, songwriter, musician, and recording artist. So much of what Arendt wrote about spoke to my experience as a musician. Part of my artistic output was in crafting and recording songs that would add something to the world of Canadian music, even after I'm gone, a way of attaining a kind of earthly immortality, as Arendt explains it. These songs almost always had lyrics that constructed a narrative so I acted as a kind of interpreter or spectator, a kind of judge of the meaning of the words and deeds of my, uh, my fellows, and I put them into narratives. Um, these songs were written with some knowledge of musical techne, so essentially how Aristotle describes the process of poesis, or productive art. On the other hand, I also played my music live in front of diverse audiences and in concert with other supporting musicians. As much as I tried to portray a persona on stage and in the media, uh, what the audience spectators experienced or interpreted was largely out of my control. They would hear the songs differently depending on their own pasts, their own tastes. This lack of control and this exposure to others often left me feeling pretty anxious the next day. It took some courage to leave the comfort and privacy of my home and to go out and be scrutinized under the lights of the stage. My sense of a lack of mastery or sovereignty over the music was furthered by my playing with others. While we followed a guiding melody and chord structure, there was plenty of room for improvisation when we often made mistakes or miscommunicated. And once a performance was over and the curtains closed, that moment was gone forever, except in the memories and stories of those who were there. Uh, this set of experiences attracted me to Arendt's theory of political action, as it engages deeply with the distinction that she makes between the political metaphors of productive and performance art, metaphors commonly used in ancient Greek thought. Uh, this distinction sheds light on the fundamental features of action as non-sovereign, as the actuality of actualization of natality and as situated by plurality. This was a theme of the opening chapter of this book along with the notion that freedom as political action discloses who the actor is while it discloses the world. Um, and I tried to connect the actor's inability to ter determine their own life story to Arendt's larger critique of political sovereignty. Um, I proceeded to examine the role of the spectator who retrospectively identifies the who within a coherent narrative and the importance of a stable and renewed space of appearance through the metaphor of the theater. Uh, the chapter concludes by exploring Arendt's thesis that freedom depends not only on a foundation of appropriate laws and political institutions, but also on action's continuous augmentation of the inspiring constitutional principles of the founding moment. Chapter two was where I hope to offer something new to a rent scholarship. So I probably go out on the furthest limb in chapter two. Here I explore several appearances of the daemon figure, not only in Arendt's public, published works and unpublished lectures, but also in the work of thinkers that she engaged with, particularly Plato's myth of Ur, Plato's accounts of Socrates' moral conscience, Heidegger's notion of Aletheia, uh, and Kant's notion of genius in his aesthetic critique. I argue that Arendt's un Arendt understands human action and thinking as revealing an existential illusion of a divine element in human beings. Uh, this reading problematizes some of Arendt's best known theoretical distinctions, such as that between what the actor makes appear through action and what the actor thinks or intends prior to action. I think that the references that she makes to the daemon read along with the Socratic dialogues show that moral deliberation is more closely bound up to the public disclosure of the who than Arendt suggests in published texts early on, early on in her career. Um, ultimately, the book proposes that including the daemon in a decisive moment of, uh, of her account of action and thinking not only self-consciously highlights, but also, I think, less consciously performs 
the idea that much of our modern and supposedly secular political discourse is entangled or uh, entangled in or leans on ideas of the absolute um, or the divine. And I believe that she saw this existential illusion of the divine as at, at the root of human thinking and action and certainly described it as a challenge uh, to be reckoned with by moderns who are attempting to establish an authoritative secular political regime. Dr. Chair, thank you very much for that beginning. We're now going to move to our first uh, responder and critic to Dr. Cheer's book, and that is Dr. Frederick M. Dolan from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Frederick M. Dolan is Professor Emeritus of Rhetoric at the University of California, Berkeley, and Professor of Humanities at the California College of the Arts in Oakland and San Francisco. He teaches and writes on the relationship between political theory and the philosophical tradition, theories of interpretation, aesthetics, and such figures as Friedrich Nietzsche, Martin Heidegger, Hannah Arendt, and Michel Foucault. His books include Allegories of America, Between Freedom and Terror, and Rhetorical Republic. And publications on Arendt specifically include An Ambiguous Citation in Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition from the Journal of Politics, and Arendt on Philosophy and Politics in the Cambridge Companion to Hannah Arendt. Well, waiting for the book to arrive, musing on the last 30 years avalanche of scholarship on Arendt, I confess I was a little doubtful that there could be much left to say about her of any real significance, but Trevor found something. He focuses on Arendt's theory of the authentic political actor, the newcomer who seemingly appears out of nowhere and says or does something unexpected that suggests new possibilities for political life. Arendt orients us to an aspect of politics we all too easily ignore, namely its expressive dimension. Quite apart from the matter of what the actor is trying to achieve and whether or not he does so, the actor also exhibits character. Action indicates not only what the actor is and what the actor is doing, but also who the actor is. Arndt attributes great value to this self-disclosure, to put it mildly. It exhibits human uniqueness, one of her three human conditions, greatness, glory, earthly immortality, and the very nature of human worldliness. Arendt's elevation of the dignity of the political is something people have always found striking and very often implausible. But Trevor notices something in Arendt that seems to enhance the value of the political beyond what even her most sympathetic readers have found so far. He points out that trying to explain the significance of political action, Arendt resorts to religious imagery. Given her commitment to secularism, that's odd. Most of us have assumed that these images are metaphors, and Trevor doesn't disagree, but he adds that they're not mere metaphors. The Athenian polis, after all, was protected by a goddess, and its citizens are known to have put to death those they believed had failed to show her proper respect. In appropriating ancient Greek concepts of heroic action, Arendt couldn't help introducing their spirituality as well. Above all, the diamond that enables mortal human beings to channel the qualities of the gods. Only a spiritual force could bring about the miracle of action and exhibit the kind of glory we see in great deeds. The political actor draws meaning into the world from the realm of transcendent value and achieves a quasi-divine status. This is heady stuff, but I still think a less theological reading is required to capture Arendt's intentions. I take my clue from her identification of politics with the performing arts. Arendt is offering an expressive, dramatistic, rhetorical picture of politics. It's the art of drama, not the divinity of the daimon, that allows us to understand politics as a source of deep and enduring truths. We can enter into the expressive dimension of politics only if we approach it the way a drama critic approaches the theater, appreciating not only the actor's ends and means, but also something more nebulous, something like what Kenneth Burke called the attitude, the state of mind, the fundamental human concerns that are at stake for the actor and those touched by his actions. The daimon, in this sense, is a theatrical effect. 
It's also a metaphor for an ironic and perhaps even tragic feature of action. The self that you disclose to others is different from the way you see yourself or want to be seen, and yet a great deal is at stake in it because how others see you determines your fate. A central feature of the daimon is its ambiguity. It is variously understood as the genius, voice of conscience, guardian, and birth attendant that accompanies mortals through life. That sounds a lot like the fickle public, for which one day you're a saint and the next day you're a criminal, which will sometimes guard you, but at other times will condemn you. For Trevor, I gather, uh, the daimon lifts the political actor out of the world of ordinary motives and aims, which are held not to operate in authentic political action. From Heidegger's concept of unconcealment, Arendt is said to take the idea that political action is not willed, i.e. not deliberative. Trevor says that Arendt repudiates discursive rationality, because otherwise action could not in initiate radically new and unexpected things. Only divine inspiration could explain that. But the idea that appreciating political action requires us to exclude consideration of the actor's motives and aims is difficult to accept. The self that's disclosed in action consists precisely of motives, aims, and means, and it's not clear how a person's actions could be at all intelligible if we couldn't appeal to their intentions. It's more coherent, I think, to understand Arendt as saying that the ordinary way of evaluating political motives and aims in terms of their moral and instrumental rationality is not sufficient for understanding the expressive dimension of action, which, as with any fictional drama, demands attention to the character, style, and that nebulous meaning. If motives and aims are an unavoidable part of understanding action, then there must be a deliberate opponent of political action as well as a spontaneous one. If the daimonic theory is right, the two components come apart and we either have ordinary, inauthentic, human, all too human action, or divinely inspired glorious deeds. An advantage to this view is that it's hard to see how spontaneity and deliberation do go together. And Arendt herself tells us precious little about it. If we want to preserve Arendt's secularity, we have to explain how they do go together. One solution is suggested to me by Nietzsche's concept of the self and Nietzsche too valued spontaneity, which he called instinct, but he also valued deliberation, at least to the extent that it was free from the constraints of the ascetic ideal and devoted instead to free-spirited self-fashioning. An instinct for Nietzsche is a drive for some object that a person acts on without consciously deliberating over whether the object is good. A person, for Nietzsche, is a hierarchy of drives, in the sense that some drives command other drives. But as Nietzsche sees it, that some drives command doesn't mean that they're stronger than other drives in a physical sense. It means that they are authoritative. The authoritative drives are what we call a person's values or principles. But how do some drives acquire authority over others? Through deliberative, willed self-fashioning that is causally related to the choices that later on in other contexts will be made instinctively or spontaneously. Spontaneity and deliberation come together over the course of a personal history, but deliberation need not occur at the moment of action, even though it is a causal condition of the ability to act. Now, in one respect, the aren't that Trevor gives us is not unfamiliar. Uh, this is the Arendt who is profoundly disappointed with modernity. God is dead, the transcendent goes unacknowledged, being has been reduced to a mere vapor, and meaning is nowhere to be found. The normalizing discourses of public and private enterprises are reducing us to mere consumers who aspire to nothing higher than comfort and security. We're happy to tick out our allotted time from birth to death. We are social insects, performing our assigned tasks automatically and thoughtlessly. A world such as this cannot shelter our loftier and more noble aspirations. It is not a fit home for man. And in her disappointment with modernity, Arendt is of her time and tradition. Modernity's discontents have been denouncing its alleged superficiality, it seems, almost forever. We find similar themes in Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Weber, Spengler, Freud, and so many others. 
Hannah Pitkin memorably characterized the object of their common fear as an attack of the blob, a menacing vision of social processes taking on a life of their own and crippling individual initiative. Well, against this, Arendt's authentic political actor is said to represent radical contestation and insistence on otherness. This is based on a different metaphor, namely natality, which Arendt's, in which Arendt says action is ontologically rooted. I don't want to exaggerate this theme, and neither does Trevor. He emphasizes that Arendt softens any messianic or, apop or apocalyptic connotations that we might sense in the idea of authentic political action. Still, the figure of natality seems to be associated with the appearance of the unexpected that interrupts the automatic processes of an inauthentic world. But natality is an odd choice of metaphor for something like that. For the birth of a child, of course, is anything but unexpected. On the contrary, it's a much anticipated event that mobilizes the energies and emotions of the entire family, and its meaning is not that of an interruption, but rather of a continuation. Metaphorically, natality means the repetition of something that occurred before, but either ran out of steam or didn't work out as expected. Children, uh, sorry, yes. Children are playing Monopoly, and a quarrel breaks out. Let's start, the, let's start the game over, someone eventually suggests. A married couple are having a bitter fight, and at some point they agree to start over. Well, how do you start over? How do you begin again? Arendt says that you have to be forgiven, released from the consequences of your past actions. Why would you forgive someone? Because you love something you have in common more than you hate them. In the case of those children, it's the game of monopoly. In the case of the couple, it's the marriage. In the case of politics, it's the political institutions themselves. Natality signifies that our political arrangements are always being tested by the next generation, who will form opinions about them that are different from ours and will demand that we pay attention to them. Each new birth leads to a situation in which the generations will be evaluating and reevaluating one another, which can be unnerving, but also exciting and renewing. Uh, natality is not about radical novelty. It's about renewing institutions by injecting new blood. I really think it's as simple uh, as that. We need, we need someone young to get the ball rolling again. Uh, the appearance of the young makes you want to get involved in exactly the same way that all of one's relations involve themselves when a newborn enters the family. But in politics, as in the family, not just any involvement is valuable. It must be the kind that really does support and sustain institutions. And that's why I think Arendt was right to turn to a more civic republican approach to political theory, one that understands political action as the care of our political institutions. She reminds us that not all forms of, quote from uh, Trevor's book, speaking, questioning, and affirming new possibilities that contest dominant discourses and existing law, not all forms of that are valuable, only those that are carried out in a spirit of civic virtue. So the politics that matters, authentic politics, is oriented to the preservation and renewal of our political institutions, which are threatened not by normalization or law, but by the social chaos created by a technology and an economy uh, that continuously disrupt the conditions under which we live. Arendt is trying to get us to see that in a liberal democratic society that's divided in terms of identities, values, and interests, the concern that ought to unite us is the health of our shared institutions, because they are where we meet to establish the terms on which we'll live together. So to conclude, uh, if in reading Arendt, were guided by the desire to understand her rootedness in real world political challenges and to make her ideas as coherent as possible, I still think we find ourselves opting for the more secular reading. The daimon and natality metaphors really are metaphors for natural features of the human condition. The expressive dimension of action and its heightening when placed 
in a dramatic context, and generational change, and continuity. Thank you, Fred Nolan, for our initial response. I'd now like to offer five minutes to Trevor to uh, engage in some response to the comments. You talk about the expressive dimension of Arendt's thought, and in the book, I tried to avoid the particular word expressive because I find that um, it's associated with the expressivism of a Rousseau or a Taylor um, and the discourse of authenticity perhaps a different discourse on authenticity, whereby the actor's ideal aim is to express through their action and speech some relatively stable or authentic essence of the self uh, determined in relation to their most deeply held moral convictions um, or in some, uh, or, or sometimes what Arendt calls the what's of one's identity. Um, and she instead emphasizes um, the idea that the disclosure of the who occurs in narrative form over the course of one's life in an interaction uh, between the worldly context of action, the actor's political aims or objectives, the performance of their speech or act, um, the given what's of their identity that they that can't but appear uh, with them and to which they're responding in some way, um, the spectator's judgments of the meaning of uh, or their action. Um, and in this account, self-disclosure is never fully accomplished. Um, it's revisable. It's way more fragmented than an authentic self. And it allows the actor a lot more freedom um, to revise who they disclose than an essentialist theory of, of, of the self. Um, now, to, to move on, uh, you highlight a very important tension or difficulty in Arendt's account of political action, that she seems to relegate the actor's moral intentions to the category of the what, and thereby excludes moral motives from how we're to judge the who that's disclosed in political action. Um, but at the same time, she claims that actions are motivated by inspiring principles that are disclosed in action, and these principles suggest moral deliberation and forethought. Um, before the act. Now, I attempted in uh, the book to highlight this problem and argue that the inclusion of the daemon um, in particularly that passage in, in the human condition that I think is one of the most decisive accounts of her dis, uh, dis, uh, accounts of action and the disclosure of the who, it makes no sense if we're to exclude moral motivation and deliberation from um, how we judge the meaning of the who and the meaning of action as it's disclosed politi politically. Um, action, she says at so many points that action is autotelic in that the end uh, requires human actions and speech to manifest them, uh, but action ends up being meaningless without being inspired by a principle or, or intention. Um, it implies a telos. Uh, the daemon, after all, is a moral guide. In, so I argue that the appearance of the daemon figure makes Arendt's earlier hard line between moral thinking on one hand and actions to disclosure of the who rather untenable. Um, I, I agree with you there. Uh, what Arendt does maintain consistently is the idea that rational and moral deliberation of the will and um, discursive, ration, discursive rationality is not what makes action free as I read Kant to be arguing. Um, so this rational and moral intention can be an important determinant in the meaning of action as judged by observing spectators. Um, actors will be judged to have been motivated by honorable uh, principles, good principles, or selfish or evil principles. And she sees the ethical principles as existing only by way of speech and action with no permanent metaphysical grounding or sanction, no universal moral law. Um, we're free to act according to good or evil principles. As much as the spontaneity of action holds the promise for freedom, it also holds the seeds of danger and, and destruction. Um, so much of Arendt's thought, as you allude to, uh, has to do with explaining how we might establish principles and institutionalized practices that can limit the agon of action, the destructive side of action. I agree with you that uh, perhaps her most important contribution today is her civic republican defense of shared healthy political institutions, especially given the rise of populism in many parts of the world. 
Um, but I see her defense of institutions really closely tied to her theory of politics as a forum for individual expression. So healthy institutions must also secure the possibility of individuals who want to get involved in politics to participate, engage, speak, and inform the debates on issues and policy questions that shape their lives. Um, the opportunity or freedom to appear in public is it's at the core of Arendt's so-called right to have rights. Um, now, I don't think that we still read Arendt after all these years because she's trying to protect a privileged class, individuals from the, the privileged classes to strut around in public and uh, for the sake of feeding their, their egos or to shape legislation in a way that's gonna serve that privilege. Uh, we continue to read her account of actions disclosure of the who in part because of this Aristotelian element that sees political praxis and the appearance in public um, no matter what the policy issue is, as integral to human dignity, um, both in that it allows us to exert at least some degree of self-governance uh, by shaping our community's laws and policies, but also in that appearing before others, we're recognized and in included as an equal member of the community. Thank you, Cheer. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now is let's go ahead and open it up for some more general discussion for at least a few minutes, given the the, the two initial talks, and uh, we'll go and open up to the panel first. Thanks for that response. It was very clarifying. I, um, uh, well, one thing I would like to hear more about, I suppose, is um, how far you think one should take this notion of a, pub a publicly dis uh, disclosed self uh, that has you know, virtually no grounds, if you like, that is infinitely revisable and infinitely interpretable. That just stri strikes me, I, I don't know how to put it in, in any other way, it just seems wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, and I, I say this in part because I spent a lot of time a while back uh, trying to develop this theme mm -hmm. and was putting Arendt together with Lacan and so on and so forth. And um, it now strikes me as not the way to go. It uh, makes her sound just a little bit too conveniently postmodern mm -hmm. and um, um, assimilable uh, mm -hmm. to things that some people anyway would like to believe, namely that there is this realm of absolute freedom where reality is whatever we say it is and we can live in a world, we can remake the world by describing it and writing books about it and getting tenure and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, I guess the question is, you know, how do we sort of know when to sort of stop that process? Uh, or what, is there any way of formulating a principled distinction mm -hmm. between a certain degree of revisability mm -hmm. and just absolute chaotic interpretive mm -hmm. chaos? Sure. Yeah. That's a, a great question, and um, I don't think that Arendt is saying that the who, or you know, in some discourses we call it a, we, we refer to a self, um, is infinitely revisable. And that's why I think that she, I mean, she talks about a, a limited kind of sovereignty or mastery that you have on who that you who you disclose. There are elements of ourselves that we don't that we can't. Revise. Um, part of political praxis and struggle is to try to convince um, others in the political community to uh, recognize us or countenance us in a more appropriate or respectful um, way. Um, but I always think of her her line: um, "I couldn't engage, but as a Jew, to do so when my my Jewishness was being um, vilified." Um, would be to live in a cloud cuckoo land. I think that this discussion's put quite nicely, poignantly, by an edited collection on feminist interpretations of Arendt a number of, of years ago, and articles that allude to the disclosure of the who through political action as a kind of um, as a kind of negotiation of how we perform the what's that are part of our. Um, our, our physicality, our identity, um, and, and how history and different structures of power have treated them, um, those aspects of ourselves that we can't that we can't change, that are just merely given. Um, 
And I see a lot of interesting conversations out there in political literature right now about how, I, I'm thinking about Anishinaabe um, scholars like uh, Glenn Coulthard or Dage Alfred who are in this debate about um, the revisability, the limits to the revisability of the Anishinaabe identity in, in their political praxis. And they're saying, look, we need to be able to be activist and take charge of how this identity is received by others on Turtle Island, but so much of our identity is rooted in the land, our heritage. These are important, unchangeable um, aspects of, uh, d dimensions of their, of their selfhood. So I don't want to suggest that Arendt talks about a, a totally revisability notion of the self. I would agree that Arendt does not have this postmodern self, you know, that maybe the revisability might make people think she does. But I guess one way to try to make sense of it, perhaps, is to think of the public self as something that's a little more re revisable and a little more out of your own control so that who we are in public is different than who we are in private, notwithstanding all the problems with that sharp distinction that are sometimes made. Um, actually, I, I, I was thinking not so much about uh, the degree to which the actor has some control, but not very much, and that is a limit, that's a constraint, but more what, what is the constraint on the spectator who is interpreting this? Uh, my sense is that we, if we want to interpret, say, the meaning of a, you know, a poem or a play or a novel, uh, we have to assume that a meaning is there to find. Uh, we can't just say the critic makes it up. Um, you've got to really believe that the text is saying something definite and determinate, and then you kind of debate over what that is. And so uh, my sense, I guess, is that uh, the only constraint that I can imagine is a, an actual um, commitment to truth. Uh, it's, you know, so this is the interpretive analog to public spiritedness in, in political action. There is no substitute, you know, you really don't want just anyone participating in the public realm. I mean, it's a nice idea, but uh, maybe, uh, but you don't, you want people participating in the right way. Uh, that is to say, in a constructive way that shows concern and care for our common world. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, you don't want just anyone reading a text and saying, oh, gosh, I, today I'd, I'd like it to mean X, and tomorrow I'd like it to mean Y. Mm -hmm. the, there, you have to believe that that critic is passionately interested in determining the truth of the text. Thanks a lot. Um, this is where I think that her uh, article, Truth and Politics, um, where she writes about the, the chapter in between pa past and future on truth and politics, where she insists on the importance of facticity and truth telling is really important. Not truth telling in terms of capital T truth, but just respecting facts, documented facts. And um, she also tries to limit this um, say anything in public possibility by uh, by asking that um, those who participate in politics uh, are motivated by the principle of responsibility. Um, and I think that that's really key to her whole theory. As you highlighted, the biggest responsibilities to the public world and its and its institutions, but also a responsibility to to, to countenance uh, plurality. And um, that's why I think she's kind of seen another resurgence is that um, people are trying to figure out how to make sense of this discourse of, of post-truth politics and the vilification of all political opponents and social media. Arendt has a lot of resources to try to um, think rationally in, in, this, uh, in this climate. Um, there are real dangers to the freedom of being able to say and do anything. And so um, the principle of responsibility, truth-telling, facticity, those are important limits to that, that uh, revisability. And, and her whole aesthetic theory of judgment is really informative there too. Um, how spectators come to generate meaning inter, intersubjectively. You have to pay attention, she says, to the details of the phenomena. Our next speaker is Dr. Karen Fry. She is the Professor of Philosophy and Chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Georgia Southern University. She received her PhD at the University of Memphis in 2002. 
And most of Fry's research examines topics in art, pop culture, religion, and politics. Her current interests involve the political thought of Hannah Arendt, and she serves as the managing editor of Arendt's studies. Prior to Georgia Southern University, she taught courses in continental philosophy, politics, and art at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. And recent publications include Beyond, uh, Beyond Religious Right and Secular Left Rhetoric, The Road to Compromise, as well as Arendt, A Guide for the Perplexed. I really appreciated the opportunity to read your book. I found a way into Arendt uh, through Jacques Tomineau, mm -hmm. so that might give you a guide point Great. as to where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and I also probably view her work as a little more secular than you do as well. So uh, just to give you a sense there. Um, what I found most fascinating about Trevor's book was his examination of the daemon concept, which that's the most innovative part, I think, because surprisingly, no one's really looked at it that carefully before, um, which is unusual because she was interested in the Greeks, you know, she studied with Heidegger and, and whatnot. Um, so I found it very interesting to have that comment, uh, that theme traced throughout her work. Usually when uh, the daemon comes up in her work, uh, it's usually in connection to ethics, and she doesn't talk about ethics that much. Um, and so the daemon functions as the conscience in a way. She talks about how um, the reason not to be a murderer is that you would be living with a murderer for the rest of your life. And this is where the discussion of Socrates' daemon comes in, which is something that tells him what not to do, but never what to do. Um, so if you had asked me before reading Trevor's book how many times she talks about that, I probably would have guessed like three or four, maybe. And he showed that it's a bit more than that. So. <laughs> um, Chir traces her use of the daemonic example further and shows how often she talks about it, suspecting perhaps that it means more than what it first appeared to scholars. And so with it, he seeks to accomplish several tasks, but I'm going to limit myself to um, the role of aesthetics and politics in a rent. It sounds like this daemonic um, theme running throughout, he connects it to Kant's genius. He, he talks about it in relationship to what sounds like an expressive aesthetical disclosure of the self in politics. Um, and I know oftentimes Arendt is viewed that way for many reasons, um, partly because she talks about uh, political judgment um, with reference to Kant's third critique as the model. Of course, what she ultimately says there is difficult to discern because she died before she wrote the book about it, um, but oftentimes people go there. Um, and so what I wanna talk about a little bit today um, was, I guess I wouldn't go so far as to say a frustration, but a concern that as much as she talks about what seems to be bringing aesthetics and politics together, she often critiques that idea as well. So I just wanted a little more um, negotiation of that in the book. Um, within Arendt's theory, the connection between art and politics is not straightforward, and it's difficult to discern. Arendt has an unusual understanding of the role of art and, categories and, and categorizes art objects as a form of what she calls work. So in the human condition, labor is this cyclical activity that happens over and over to satisfy things like hunger and never attains its goal because you constantly have to renew that. Work is that area that builds that uh, more permanent world and basically braces you a little bit against um, that need that never ends, right? So it gives you the space and I see these as preconditions to politics, right? So you need to have a stable world where politics can take place through making things. Um, and so work works through techne, where you have an idea and, and then you make the object in the world, right? Um, so humans have to have time outside of sheer survival to take part in politics. The world of fabrication is lasting and does not need to be remade. And so art contributes to the lastingness and durability of the public space needed for politics since art objects are among the most durable of fabricated items because they are not typically used at all. And so she categorizes art as a form of work, not as a form of action. That may be problematic, but nonetheless, <laughs> right? So, um, so artists can assist politics because 
poets and artists can preserve renderings of political actions in art, but nevertheless, art remains a type of work that begins with an idea and ends with something durable, making it more like the teleological forms of politics that Cheer acknowledges that Arendt is against in general. So I wanted to look at a couple of quotes from Arendt. Uh, the first one's from Between Past and Future. She's talking about the Greeks, and she says there's this tension between art and politics in ancient Greece. Uh, she says, quote, the mistrust and actual contempt of artists arose from political considerations. Fabrication of things, including the production of art, is not within the range of political activities. It even stands in opposition to them. Okay, so there's one area in which she seems, and, and she does do this somewhat frequently, is every time art and politics sort of comes up, there's always this kind of move to um, maybe denying the close connection. Um, but it's clear that other times they seem much closer together. Mm -hmm. I think this is an, an area of investigation that needs to be examined a bit further. So there are some scholars who um, argue that Arendt aestheticized politics, and she is careful to note that Arendt is against the Nazi aestheticization of politics that would turn politics into a form of fabrication. Yet much of Cheer's overarching argument in the text assumes a direct connection between aesthetics and politics in Arendt's theory, and that the divine inspiration of the daemon is a kind of aesthetical relation that governs politi political action and political judgment. Yet this argument would be stronger if, um, if the following from her 1961 essay, Freedom and Politics, was addressed. Okay, so here's another quote. Because all action demands virtuosity, and because virtuosity is characteristic particular to the applied arts, the opinion has been widely held that politics constitutes an art. If it, as is frequently the, ca the case, the work of art is understood to mean creative art, and the state is regarded as a work of art, as indeed the greatest work of art created by the hand of man, then such an idea is completely false. In terms of the creative arts, which produce something concrete that survives the labor that produced it and is completely dissociated from it, politics are the very reverse of art. The state is not a work of art because if for no other reason, its existence never becomes independent of the actions of the men who created it. So in this essay, Arendt recognizes a similarity between politics and art, and here's what she says, quote, Exactly as music, the ballet, and theater have a need of an audience before which to unfold virtuosity, action too requires the presence of others in a politically organized sphere where men live together in some sort of community. So when she does bring up aesthetics and politics, she says the main relationship between the two is this, the publicness of them. They both have, both artistic performances and um, politics have an audience or a public that end up judging the meaning of that work or performance or political action. So there could be some room here to argue for a more robust relationship between art and politics and Arendt's thought. Cheer might want to argue that performance arts are entirely different from other kinds of artworks and therefore outside of the category of work. This is not a move that Arendt herself makes that I'm aware of which could expand upon Arendt's view in a different direction. Or one could focus on the similarities between art and action, such as its publicness, or how it can contribute to something lasting or immortal. Further, the word virtuosity often comes up in discussions of art and politics in Arendt's work, which is ripe for exploration. Perhaps her discussion of history as a kind of storytelling or narrative may help bring politics and aesthetics closer together. So given her criticisms of the conflation of art and politics, it's unclear what her precise view is. Thierry is more careful than most scholars who fail to discuss her hesitancy at all. Uh, further, he distinguishes between performance arts and other kinds of art, which is a strength. Typically, his discussion of the actor as inspired by the daemon or the genius of some sort is discussed as a metaphor, uh, building a slight bulwark against literal interpretations uh, of such concepts. It may be more convincing to develop this argument in more depth by directly addressing some of her hesitancies at greater length, and even trying to create a space maybe for, between Arendt's view and his own, something like that. The other thing in, in this realm of concepts that I'm focusing on here is the notion of genius in Arendt. Um, and to think of action as a work of genius is complicated in her theory as well. Uh, particularly in her early work, she was really critical of the notion of genius. 
Uh, the cult of the genius is a romantic idea that Arendt uh, rejects for many reasons, but the main political reason is the presumed hierarchy of persons inherent in the notion, as well as the romantic sense of politics that a belief in genius engenders. In Arendt's early work, like The Origins of Totalitarianism, she speaks about genius in pejorative terms, such as when she accuses social Darwinists of naturalizing the phenomenon of genius in racial terms. She discusses a link between German romantic intellectual ideas and race thinking by making commonplace the idea that emancipation was possible for those who were not born nobles through the force of personality that was innate. Arendt notes that there were lots of books about hereditary genius in the mid 19th century. Genius was innate and justified natural privileges, which Arendt thinks contributed to discrimination and the attribution of flaws to other races. Further, in her Rahel Varnhagen book, uh, The Life of a Jewess, Arendt calls Varnhagen's desire to, quote, make a work of art of one's own life, end quote, was, quote, the great error that Rahel shared with her contemporaries, end quote, which Arendt calls, quote, a misconception of the self. So trying to elevate her status in society through her own creativity and talents as the cult of the romantic genius tended to do, did not secure her any political rights. So at minimum, I think Arendt was suspicious of discussions of the idea of artistic genius having something to do with politics. And it was clear she thought that some forms of the romantic notion contributed to dangerous ideas of politics in Germany. Um, given that, it seems to require a more lengthy discussion about Arendt's suspicions to address them in the overarching argument. For Cheer, the daemon has been, quote, variously understood as the genius, the voice of conscience, guardian, and birth attendant that accompanies mortals through life. So the connection between the daemon and the concept of genius should be explored further before it's uh, fully linked to how an actor is disclosed. And then I go on to talk a little bit about there might be some resources in her later work on Kant. Although it's really tricky, because if you've read the lectures on Kant's political philosophy, they are her lecture notes. Please no one ever published my lecture notes. <laughs> you know, I might regret that. But it's very difficult to discern, uh, is she commenting on Kant? Is she trying to explain Kant? Is this her own view? Where is she going with this? And you can make some, I think, significant conclusions there. Um, so I, I talk about a couple of places where you might go to to explain it a little bit more. I basically fo focused on the aesthetics and politics in Arendt and, and want to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you, Dr. Fry, for that response. Trevor, we'll go and turn it over to you for the initial response. You mentioned that um, my argument in the book could be strengthened if I drew out the distinction between productive and perform performance art. Um, I tried to speak to this distinction in chapter two, um, just to explain a bit. Um, she saw the, Arendt saw the tradition of Western philosophy's understanding of politics as dominated by concepts like rule, sovereignty, mastery, and she thought that part of the reason for this was that politics was often explained, especially by Plato, through metaphors from creative or productive art or according to the same process as poesis with its intellectual virtue of techne or instrumental reason. Um, so the dominance of this way of seeing politics led to all sorts of problems like the will of rulers or would-be rulers to dominate others, um, the treatment of nature and other human beings as mere means to one's ends, uh, the devaluation of political action and citizen engagement for its own sake. Um, and the notion, this is, I think, the key to the quote that you pulled from that article uh, about freedom. The notion that politics was over and done with when a well-constructed regime or constitution was established. Um, in the human condition and what is freedom from between past and future, she's trying to reinvigorate a forgotten Greek tradition by which politics was instead understood as, uh, sorry, through the metaphor of performance art, um, which has much in common with praxis and the intellectual virtue of phronesis or practical wisdom. Um, you quite rightly highlight that political action and performance art share the need for an audience of spectators 
to ultimately determine their meaning. It's the publicness that they share. But I think that they also, also share a few other features that I tried to draw out. Um, they're autotelic, or they contain their own end, um, according to Aristotle and later Arendt. Um, the whole point of performance art is to play well or with virtuosity. Um, the final purpose or the telos is contained in the doing itself. Uh, no separate object is left behind. Um, similarly, the purpose of action um, is what Aristotle calls eupraxia, a kind of experiential good linked to living well, happiness in Aristotle's theory. And in Arendt's, I argue it's the disclosure of the who in the world. She doesn't really talk about happiness. Um, as well as the redemption of one's initial beginning in the world, their biological birth through a kind of second beginning. Um, one of the interesting things that the daemon metaphor accomplishes when she cites it is the notion that, that the daemon is a spiritual companion assigned to humans at birth. Uh, this myth, the myth of Ur in, in the Republic, says that we pick our life stories or identities in the, the it's a myth about the afterlife. So when we're our souls are being waiting to be shot back to earth, uh, the souls pick their life stories or their identities, but they pick them according to an order established by lot. And then we begin our lives accompanied by our assigned daemon. Um, so by citing this daemon figure, and this invites a quick revisitation of the myth of Ur. Uh, readers are reminded that action is beginning, it's a response to our first beginning, our birth, um, and like each art performance, action introduces something new to the world. We're, we're also reminded through the myth of her that political action discloses a who that is only ever partly in control of the results of their act, their life story, the identity that they perform. So we're decentered non-sovereign actors like musicians playing uh, in improvisation with, with others. Um, just like the characters in the myth of Ur whose order of selection is determined by lot. Um, or like political revolutionaries who are striding, trying to start a new world together but not knowing the results of what they're, the ramifications or results of what they're, of what they're doing. Um, so I see her not as saying that politics is art, that they're the same thing. Um, when she does overtly say that politics is very much not like art, she goes and explains productive creative art. Mm -hmm. She doesn't overtly say it's not like performance art either. And I think that she saw a lot of politics, but it's, she said it was deep, it had a so much in common with performance art. Um, so I, I take your invitation seriously and I thank you for it to explore that more, like where does performance art end, where does politics begin? Um, now, I acknowledge and agree with you that Arendt was suspicious of the romantic notion of genius for the reasons that you explained. Um, in the book, I only focus on Arendt's treatment of Kant's account of genius in the critique of, of judgment. Uh, this could be a weakness of the book. I don't trace other times that she mentions genius in other contexts. Um, now, when Arendt compares the political actor to Kant's genius. Uh, she does so because both depend on an audience of spectators um, who, through their intersubjective judgments, clip the wings, they so-called clip the wings of genius and make what the artist or the actor contributes to the world intelligible. Um, I don't think that Arendt meant to speak of the actor in any romantic sense that would paint them as superior to others, more authentic than others, or more entitled than anyone else. Um, I think that what she saw in Kant's genius was a possibility for every human being when they act. It's the sui generis element of action that she was tying to genius. And this is closely tied to the concept of natality, um, that action manifests something totally new in the world um, it has the potential sometimes to introduce new inspiring principles or stories to be told. And um, sometimes this newness is not in in intelligible. The world doesn't know what to make of it. Um, and it's, it's sui generis in that she rejects that these principles are grounded 
metaphysically, like Plato's forms or like you know, God, older notions of God's will that somehow sanction these principles me metaphysically. That's why I think the Daemon figure is so unusual uh, that she cites it at, the, at, these, key, at these key moments. Um, these principles seem to come from within us. They're located in some site called within us. Um, but this within us is itself a site of duality. Think about the two in one of thinking. And this so-called within us is also uh, uh, the site of a kind of alterity that's reflected outside in, in the world's plurality. Um, th she writes about how the two-in-one is a reflection of the plurality of the world. So it's not a stable or authentic kind of static self that she's describing. I guess then we have a couple of comments sure. to what you just said. Um, one would be that I don't feel like she makes a distinction in any clear way or in any sustained way between performance art and non-performance arts. Um, in fact, if you, I'm not sure you would find the phrase performance art in her work. Rarely. <laughs> yeah. Rarely, but. Yeah. Um, so. You know, it. I think it's something that should definitely be explored more. Um, I don't know if it can happen within Arendt's theory, or you have to jump outside of it or not. You know, but that's a move to go to. Um, and there's, you know, that needs to be examined more for sure. Um, and the comparison to Kant's genius. Um, some of the, the my takeaway from some from the discussion there mainly was her preference for. You know, she agrees with Kant that the spectator is more important than the genius, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and when you go through Kant's third critique, there's really only like four or five pages on genius. Mm -hmm. And everything else is about judgment in the community and the mm -hmm. spectators and, and yeah, and the census communists and all that. So um, I'm not sure she would make a connection there between the actor and the genius. That's, I think that's uh, very fair to say your second point there. And, and to speak to your first point, uh, although she doesn't, I, th I think that although she doesn't make the distinction between performance art and productive art very often, I read the, it as a decisive distinction that she's drawing between the two of them in the chapter, What is Freedom? Well, I, I guess the question I have is, um, what are the implications of the fact, if it is a fact, it's my interpretation, that, that her conception of art is just uh, wrong? Uh, the idea that uh, a work of art is the outcome of a fabrication process in any sense resembling um, uh, making a stool uh, or a table, um, the artist doesn't have a conception in advance of what she is going to make. She discovers what her conception is in making it, much like the actor. And uh, the fact that it takes the form of a thing is really irrelevant. Um, and the distinction between the performing arts and the creative arts is also, um, uh, well, I want to say not relevant. I'm not, um, you know, the, the, if you look at Wolheim's discussion of the difference between creative art and performing arts, you know, he points out that the difference is that the creative arts result in a thing which is an individual. It's a unique individual object. There's only one of them, you know. The, the performing arts are different because um, uh, the, the, the object that constitutes the work of art is a type. And every performance of that type is a token of that type, right? So when we go to a symphony and you know, we hear Harnoncourt conducting Beethoven's Fifth or whatever, what we're hearing a token of, the, of Beethoven's Fifth, mm -hmm. which is an abstract object, mm -hmm. but an object nonetheless. Mm -hmm. It was still something that was, quote, made mm -hmm. you know, by Beethoven, but not made in the sense of somebody making a chair or a stool. And that seems to be really, really important because I, if I'm, I may be misremembering this, but I think that one of the things that Arendt says is that when you look at the outcome of a production process, you don't learn anything about the person except that he knew how to make this thing. Well, that, that's completely different in the case of a work of art. So I don't know what the implications of this are for Arendt's wider thinking, but it seems pretty crucial to me. And I would agree that it's definitely a, a position that's lacking, <laughs> right? But I suspect that 
it comes from going back to ancient Greece. And so where the craftsmen and the artists were really seen as equivalent and art was not really considered to be expressive. Um, but well, a lot of things have happened since then, <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the distinction between, the, the, the hard distinction between performance and, and productive art um, seems very old fashioned, <laughs> you know, um, given that the two are blended in real life uh, by artists all the time. Um, and I, I don't want to, I think that what I found useful and eye opening was the use of performance art and, and like the way that she draws these perhaps two radical distinctions between the two, the, the metaphors I found to be eye opening to understand politics. So our third presenter, unfortunately, is not present, but luckily we do have a reader who is going to read uh, her paper. So our uh, third uh, responder to uh, Dr. Trevor Cheer's book, Cheer's book, excuse me, is uh, Jennifer Gaffney from Gettysburg College. And uh, Jennifer Gaffney joined the Gettysburg Philosophy Department in 2016 after receiving her PhD in philosophy and her MA in history from Texas A&M University. Dr. Gaffney's interests are in social and political philosophy with emphases in continental philosophy, philosophy of race, ethics, and the history of philosophy. Her current research focuses on political philosopher uh, Hannah Arendt and examines questions concerning the exclusion of diasporic people from the modern liberal state citizenship and the politics of historical memory. Dr. Gaffney places a high value on multidisciplinary approaches to addressing these philosophical questions. In her own work, she draws on her research that she has conducted in the disciplines of history on the Haitian Revolution to consider the scope and limits of Arendt's thought for addressing the global impact of the European legacy of slavery and colonization on political life today. So her recent uh, publications include Memories of Exclusion, Hannah Arendt and the Haitian Revolution, our rent in imperialism, another origin of totalitarianism, our rent on the loneliness of liberal citizens, and can a language go mad, our rent in Derrida, the political significance of the mother tongue. So our reader today is going to be uh, Jorn Kroll to help us uh, facilitate this. In Hannah Arendt's theory of political action, <clears throat> Daimonic Disclosure of the Who, Trevor Cheer offers a novel and expansive reading of an underappreciated dimension of Arendt's theory of political action. Drawing on her use of the figure of the daimon, she argues that the tension arises in Arendt's effort to develop a post-metaphysical basis for thinking and acting. While Arendt resists, resists traditional metaphysical approaches to grounding thinking and action, her appeal to concepts like the daimon remain, quote, bound to notions of the spiritual, transcendent, and the divine, unquote. She thus sets out to explore this tension in Arendt's thought and explicate its sequences for her political framework. In so doing, she provides an important interpretive framework for re-examining and deepening our standing of the who that Arendt believes politi political action discloses. With this, he challenges Arendt's theory of, of action by raising the question of whether she succeeds in completing her critique of the religious and metaphysical imposition of absolutes in political life. Chia's aim in this book is twofold. First, he wishes to highlight the importance of Arendt's efforts to conceive of political action as a site of both self and world disclosure. She explains that in asserting the irreducible uniqueness of the who, Arendt makes a decisive intervention in political theories that equate freedom with sovereignty, as well as those that ground human affairs in a teleological conception of history. In elucidating the process by which the who is disclosed, Arendt challenges what she perceives as the totalizing and reductive impulses in both of these approaches to political life. Yet, she also insists that the ground of the who 
seems to refer to a, quote, divine element in human beings, unquote, which, in turn, raises the question of whether Arendt implicates herself in the very conception of transcendence that she wishes to overcome. In view of this, she explains that the second aim of the book is to examine the important but underappreciated role that the diamond plays in Arendt's discourse on political action so as to deepen and complicate the stakes of her project. A figure of ancient Greek religion, the daimon serves as a mediator between the gods and humans. It appears not only in Arendt's work, but also in the work of the thinkers with whom she was engaged throughout her career, including Heidegger in his notion of the authentic disclosure of Dasein, Jaspers in his discourse on the valid personality, and Kant in his account of the genius. The philosophical relevance of this figure, she explains, comes into view as early as Plato's myth of Ur, grounding what we might call the voice of conscience, whispering guidance, or the birth attendant who accompanies mortals through life, but who never becomes visible to the actor himself. While Arendt only makes periodic reference to the daimon, she argues that these references appear at such pivotal points in her discourse on action that they warrant our attention. Perhaps her most notable reference to this figure occurs in the human condition. She explains here that while the who appears clearly and unmistakably to others, it quote, remains hidden from the person himself, like the daimon in Greek religion, which accompanies each man through his life, always looking over his shoulder from behind, and thus visible only to those he encounters. Unquote. By considering Arendt's theory of political action in light of the figure of the daimon, she thus endeavors to highlight an important, albeit underappreciated, conflict in her critique of modern sovereignty and teleological approaches to history. On the other hand, Arendt seems to identify a divine element in human beings, or at least an inescapable existential illusion of this divine presence. On the other hand, she is intent on distancing action thinking and judging from any residual vocabulary of transcendence. This, of course, raises a number of important questions, not just about Arendt's ability to complete her own critique of metaphysical absolutism and teleological conceptions of history, but also about our ability in a secularized modern world to recover a sense of meaning without an appeal to the divine. The lens that Chia offers for interpreting Arendt's theory of action is unique and insightful. Indeed, while a religious metaphor is present throughout Arendt's corpus, few have taken so seriously its vast implications for understanding the scope and limits of Arendt's political framework. Chia makes clear how pervasive her theological grammar is, even in her efforts to challenge Heidegger, Kant, Marx and Hegel in their respective views of history and sovereignty. With this, she is careful to point out that the ways in which the figure of the daimon enables her to ground a notion of action that is worldly, plural, and capable of displacing messianic notions of the end of history. The daimon at once brings the divine into our supposedly secular and post-metaphysical politics while at the same time substantiating the very framework that she develops in order to subvert totalizing and reductive approaches to the political. With this in mind, I would like to raise three questions in response to Chia's reading of Arendt. The first concerns the status that he suggests Arendt gives to the daimon in her discourse on action. 
as Trier acknowledges, Arendt's use of the daimon is metaphorical. In contrast to Heidegger in his account of the conscious, or Kant in his discourse on the genius, Arendt uses simile and metaphor to incorporate this figure into her description of the disclosure of the who. As we know from the life of the mind, metaphors bridge an unbridgeable gap between the visible and invisible. They render in words things that are unnameable and, in doing so, leave a gap between what is and what is said. Though it may be problematic to consider an earlier work like The Human Condition in light of these later reflections, I nevertheless wonder whether her discourse on metaphor might be instructive for understanding the role of the figure of Daimon plays in her account of the disclosure of the who, whereas she suggests that it reveals Arendt's belief in a divine element in human action, perhaps Arendt wants to make a weaker claim, one that speaks to our inability to name the ground of action. Arendt's use of the daimon, while helpful for clarifying what it is like to appear to others as an irreducible unique who, is nevertheless metaphorical and may therefore serve to challenge our ability to account for the ground of thought and action, no less than the possi possibility of complete self and world closure. A further related question concerns Chia's reading of Arendt's notion of disclosure, particularly as this is developed in his discussion of Arendt's critical appropriation of Heidegger. While she highlights the crucial counterpoints that Arendt offers to Heidegger, she also draws a parallel between their respective accounts of authentic disclosure that may be too strong. She notes that Arendt's conception of the disclosure of the who is more worldly than Heidegger's to the extent that it is not oriented by the inward, silent resolve of authentic Dasein, but rather by the actor's responsiveness to the vis visible and audible call of human plurality. She also suggests that the who that comes to appear with and through others in the space of politics derives its immortality not from something transcendent, but rather through, quote, retrospective narrative, a concretization of fragile and fleeting action through stories whose exemplary order uh, can be interpretively expanded into the future. Yet, Chia maintains that for Arendt, world disclosure action, quote, makes the public realm a spiritual realm, unquote. He argues, too, that the public realm becomes a space in which transcendent being may be disclosed. While Shia remarks that this disclosure of being requires a symbolic or representative order, he also insists that it is expressive of something divine or transcendent. In view of this, I wonder if more could be said about Arendt's notion of the disclosure of the who and Heidegger's notion of the disclosure of being. Turning once again to the life of the mind, we find that Arendt criticizes Heidegger for presuming that meaning of being and truth of being say the same. Indeed, she suggests that because appearances are only ever disclosed as semblances that can reveal and conceal themselves, any assertion we might make about them will always remain provisional and never absolute. She argues, too, that thinking must be understood not in terms of the acquisition of metaphysical truth, but rather in terms of a quest for meaning and the open possibility that this entails. In view of this, I would like to raise a question of whether Arendt has in mind a Heideggerian notion of the disclosure of being or if her account of the disclosure of the who concerns something more like the disclosure of meaning. Of course, it may be problematic to assert such a stark distinction between the two. Yet Scheer's argument appears to hinge on a reading of Arendt that emphasizes former. For this reason, I would be curious to learn more about 
how Arendt's concern to distance meaning and truth in her later writing might complicate Scheer's account of her appeal to the divine. Whereas Scheer suggests that Arendt amends Heidegger's account of insisting that the disclosure of, disclosure of being requires judgment, I would like to suggest that there may, may be an even greater distance between Arendt and Heidegger than Scheer indicates. My final question concerns Scheer's concluding remark on the broader implications of the tension he identifies in Arendt's discourse on action. Indeed, this tension is important not just for our under understanding of Arendt, but also for understanding the loss of meaning in the modern age and the possibility of reclaiming that meaning without an appeal to the divine. I find compelling Chia's suggestion that by attending to this loss, we might be able to develop a better understanding of the lingering religious vocabulary in Aaron's thought. It also leads me to wonder whether Chia's project enables us to begin putting Aaron's theory of political action in dialogue with discourses like the negative theology of Jacques Derrida. After all, Aaron's use of the daimon, no less than her repeated appeal to religious concepts throughout her writings, work against the religious absolutism that cover our over plurality and net natality. The daimon is one among the several religious references Aaron makes that seem to affirm alterity and difference, no less than the imminence of the meaning of political action introduces to the world. I would therefore be interested to learn more about the figures and discourses that she believes we can put in dialogue with Arendt now that we have his incisive interpretation of the role of the divine in her theory of political action. Thank you, Jorn, for, uh, for reading Professor um, Jennifer Gaffney's uh, comments and questions. I found these questions really got to, to the heart of a lot of the um, issues and questions that I found most, um, most perplexing when I was writing the book. Um, the first question, I'll reword them. Uh, first one had to do with the status of the daemon. Is it metaphorical? Or am I arguing um, that she actually is asserting that there's a divine element in human beings? And I remember this moment when I kind of had to decide, okay, what am I saying in this book? <laughs> which, which of these am I going to assert? And it was, uh, I, 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 it's a key question that I wrestled with. And I found I needed to remind myself that Arendt uses the daemon as a simile in the moment in the human condition that I argue is decisive for her account of action. Um, when the daemon appears more clearly to the spectators from behind the back of the actor. Um, and I got help from another section in The Life of the Mind when she discusses Socrates' two-in-one thinking process. Uh, here she says that thinking appears to reveal the existential illusion of a divine element in humans, one that comes, as Professor Gaffney says, from our inability to account for the source or ground of thinking. Um, Arendt explains that the fact that the source of our thinking seems to come both from inside and outside of us is likely at the root of our very notion of a uh, spiritual realm. Um, so I think she found the da daemon really effective at evoking this illusion, um, an illusion that I think she found insurmountable and constant. Um, still, there's a part of me that feels um, that, that and, you know, maybe this is individual projection and that, that sometimes happens as a writer and an interpreter. Um, part of me thinks that Arendt did actually, not metaphorically, but she did find something divine or at least uh, sacred and irreplaceable in human beings. And I know we can, have, there's a key philosophical argument, can't we do this without metaphysical grounding? Um, she found something divine, sacred in human beings, not just metaphorically, and wanted to show that this element appears in the realm of appearance and plurality through action and judgment. It doesn't just exist in a separate metaphysical realm. 
Um, she leans really heavily, after all, on Augustine's notion of, of natality and the uniqueness of each individual. Um, so Fred and I have a, a slightly different interpretation of the role of natality in, in her work. Um, and she has a really important reason politically to argue for the sacredness um, and a divine element in each human being as a way of fighting against the way that totalitarianism disclosed people instead as superfluous, um, mere life, replaceable. Um, I'll leave it at that. Second question. In saying that disclosive action makes the public realm a spiritual realm where a transcendent being is revealed, don't I draw too close a connection between Arendt and Heidegger? Um, Arendt distinguishes the provisional and open disclosure of meaning in the pluralistic realm of appearance from the disclosure of capital T, truth. Doesn't this complicate her appeal to the divine? Um, I agree with Professor Gaffney that there's an uh, important distance between Arendt and Heidegger. I hope I drew it out in the book. Um, uh, Gaffney quite rightly points out that for Arendt, a disclosure of the who and the world that is meaningful takes place in the pluralistic realm of appearance. It depends on other spectators and often other actors. Um, this meaning takes narrative shape and it relies on linguistic representations to disclose phenomena that would otherwise stay concealed. And this, is, this meaning that's disclosed is a matter of interpretation and debate. Uh, the truth of disclosure, the truth of disclosure depends on facticity and attention to detail, not capital T truth in an absolute sense. So I agree with Gaffney that there's a complicated tension between Arendt's imminent worldly accounts of disclosive action, um, the intersubjective judgment of meaning, and on the other hand, her references to the divine, which traditionally evoke the absolute, the otherworldly, the complete disclosure of being and tr capital T truth. I found this an interesting section, and it is about Jaspers, so I'd love to talk about it after this. Um, part of our panel. Uh, she calls the public realm a spiritual realm at one point in her Laudatio to, to Jaspers um, when she's mentioning the, the concept of humanitas. Um, she says, when we render our judgment about the meaning of human affairs in public, we disclose our spirit. Um, and this is something that is not objective or absolute, but it is something valid. It has validity, it has meaning. In that Laudatio she mentions, um, um, she alludes to the daemon. Um, and I think it's a useful metaphor in highlighting some features about the spirit or the, I think the who of the actor um, that was at least in part inspired by Jasper's philosophy. Uh, she didn't use the daemon to evoke the notion of absolute being or truth um, I don't think she thinks that this is f f something so absolute as disclosed when people um, render their judgment in public speech before others, but she's using it to evoke themes like the existential illusion of divinity brought on by our not being able to name where thought and action come from, um, to develop the notion of a two-in-one structure of moral thinking, um, and the notion that there is much of ourselves that's merely given and that we cannot assert sovereignty over in our self-conscious public acts. The third question is, what other figures and discourses can we put in dialogue with Arendt to better understand what's at stake in trying to disclose meaning through action in the modern age, uh, given this presence of a lingering religious vocabulary? Um, in a way that recognizes difference and alterity, but doesn't affirm a kind of religious absolutism. And um, I, I thank Professor Gaffney for suggesting Derrida. Um, I've, as I mentioned in my intro, I found it interesting to consider a rent with, along with Taylor, who has quite a different approach. He's interesting because he traces how much of the moral and political language of modern secular societies grows out of Christian discourses, if you read his book, The Secular Age. Um, but he's committed to identifying an approach to justice based on the appropriate and dignified political recognition of plurality of individuals and communities in modern societies. Yet he's quite different from Arendt in that he's a practicing Catholic and he wear, I think he wears his practice 
and his religion on his sleeve in a way that Arendt doesn't. He's not trying to get over the residual language of transcendence or divinity at all. Instead, he sees it as fundamental to many people's deepest moral convictions, including his own. And he's trying to think about how we can hold on to these convictions if we want to, while relativizing our truth claims enough to meaningfully, respectfully deliberate with others that have different moral perspectives and not disregard their perspectives out of hand. So they have quite different approaches and I find reading them together illuminating. So at this point, we're going to open it again up for either general discussion, beginning with the panel. Um, I'd like to start with uh, maybe uh, Professor Karen Fry, if you can maybe act as slightly as a proxy a little bit for Jennifer uh, <laughs> a, a little bit, and then we can open up for uh, some general discussion afterwards. Dr. Gaffney did have a chance to read your comments, and so I have oh. a bit of a response that <laughs> I can right. look at quickly. But she basically restates some of the things that mm. she said previously. Um, she says she remains concerned about Trevor's emphasis on the transcendent and the divine in his reading of Arendt and wonders whether um, the concept of daemon is made a little too much of. Um, she remains concerned about the reading of Heidegger that Trevor offers. While he does spell out important differences between Arendt and Heidegger, she continues to think that it's too much to suggest that Arendt believes that disclosure involves a disclosure of being. That seems to be a crucial part of Arendt's critique of Heidegger precisely because it introduces the notion of transcendence that is totalizing and politically problematic. Of course, I could be, she says, I could be wrong about this, but I do think it warrants further discussion. And she says she suggested negative theology because that seems to her to be a more fruitful avenue to engage the question of the divine in Arendt's thought since it makes the divine eminent rather than transcendent. And um, totally to jump to my own point of view, <laughs> I just have a couple of comments too. Um, as someone who also wrote about religion in, in politics at one point in my time, I did spend a lot of time trying to find out what Arendt's position was. And though she believed in God, she did not practice in any traditional sense of any kind of religion, um, but there's really precious little there um, re referring to the transcendence. And in her dissertation even on Augustine, um, you know, her critique of both him and Heidegger's thought is the focus on the transcendent realm rather than the eminent realm, you know, which seems kind of important there. And, you know, she claims that love of the neighbor in Augustine is contingent on, you know, some eternal realm rather than actually loving the person who's right mm -hmm. there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I did look a little bit into that, the Jaspers piece, um, and where she talks about um, spirit and the daemon, um, and she says the daemon is not demonic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which could be read as, okay, it, maybe it's just not evil, <laughs> or it could be read as maybe it's not spiritual, you know? Thank you for m mentioning that she's um, trying to make the possibility of loving the other imminent and not transcendent. I think right. that the daemon, again, is useful for that because it comes down to earth in the story of the myth of her. Like, um, I, I think that there's an element of her that I read along with H Hegel, you know, and the reading of Hegel's ladder, trying to build institutions so that we can experience, you know, the meaning of life, the purpose of life here in the worldly context, not, not just in the afterlife in some metaphysical realm. Uh, well, I guess um, one comment I have is would really be a comment more to Jennifer Gaffney, and I'm puzzled by this idea that uh, Heidegger's concept of being is somehow absolute or transcendent, or that there's a uh, some sort of radical distinction to be made between the truth of being and the meaning of being. Um, I mean, this is obviously a very complicated question, but to uh, summarize, you know, for Heidegger, the truth of being is the meaning of being. Uh, he doesn't think that there's some kind of capital M, capital T metaphysical truth, you know, that he's getting at. That's not what being is for him. So that puzzles me. I, I'm assuming this ger just derives from Arendt's interpretation of Heidegger. I would just say that's you know probably not reliable. Um, and the the other point is uh, I, I'm not quite sure how to formulate this, but this business of um, 
negative theology and, and the sp spirit and so forth. You know, even people who really, quote, believe in the soul and the spiritual uh, know that, you know, that word for, is a metaphor for them too, right? They don't know how to explain this either. And uh, I guess that's where negative theology comes in. So I just want to second that as a, a way to go. You know, we talk about um, uh, the self or the soul. If I look at you and I see you, what do I see? You know, it's not your eyes or your <laughs> nose or your, you know, you can't, uh, you couldn't give an objective description uh, of you that would include you. And I mean you, I'm addressing you. I just think that's a very, you know, <laughs> difficult fundamental problem. We shouldn't expect anyone to solve it anytime soon. The distinction that Professor Gaffney makes between Arendt and Heidegger isn't where I see the distinction that, that was so important. I mean, I found the distinction between Arendt and Heidegger that's most important is how to, um, whereas Heidegger says that authenticity is lived out in a kind of more solipsistic way, and Jacques Temenyo makes that point in his book about Arendt and Heidegger, she sees, um, she doesn't use the word authentic, but she sees the disclosure of the who in the world in the public realm um, amongst the plural, plurality of, of others. Um, I don't think Arendt paints Heidegger as saying that um, the disclosure of being is, like the work of Dasein is to ever disclose being this absolutely. I mean, that's one of the reasons why he's a huge influence on hermeneutics and, and um, the world of interpretation. Given the, uh, the current uh, political situation in, in the United States, if you were kind of aren't, what kind of political advice, uh, I assume nonpartisan, would you give to uh, those who are interested in political action, uh, in journalism, and so on, in other words, to publicly engaged figures, or even, you know, just really regular voters, uh, to clear up the, the image, uh, what, are, what is currently going on, how to address it from the wisdom of Hannah Arendt. Um, thanks for that question. I'll try to be brief. There's so much of value said, for instance, in the annual um, conferences hosted by the, by the Bard um, College and the Hannah Arendt Center there that to try to focus on what can be said by people interested in Arendt um, to address some of the challenges um, facing democracies, not only in the United States and Canada, but around the world. And I, I think that if I were to put a Arendtian hat on, um, I'd speculate to say that she, um, that she would um, invite uh, people to meet other citizens in actual physical spaces where you have to stand um, with them in physical space and confront them as, a, as real human beings. I think that we vilify each other way too easily on social media and create a kind of us versus them polarization of politics. And this kind of disclosure of the who that she talks about as being so important in politics really gets distorted through the kind of avatars and persona that people kind of hide behind through social media Id identities. Um, she would be um, reminding people that uh, without acting through uh, the political institutions created by their constitution, that those limits on executive power are going to, are, are going to, are under threat. Like just because you have a constitution with a division of powers doesn't mean they're, it's going to work at limiting executive power. You have to act through them um, constantly. And I think that's why uh, her emphasis on action and the, met and the metaphor performance art is, is uh, crucial or at least helpful that politics is not like the plastic arts or creative arts where you can create something you have an air gone, the work is done, you have a constitution, a set of institutions, and, and that's gonna, the work is done, politics is done, and that's gonna guarantee justice and freedom. No, you have to constantly be vigilant and acting th through them for a healthy democracy. I think, you know, she was always an advocate for freedom of speech, but I think at this point in time, she might go back to some of the, the thinking that she had in crisis in education and things like that, where people need to respect expertise, I think. Um, and like giving up on truth altogether is definitely a problem. But one thing we haven't really talked about much at all is that she does think truth and meaning are different. <laughs> you know, and she does have many different kinds of knowledge. 
And in politics, you know, doxa is kind of what's revealed and maybe that's mm -hmm. what she thinks the valid personality is where mm -hmm. Socrates comes in and questions someone and then gets to the truth of who they are from their place in the world, mm -hmm. but it's not a truth that's true for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel as though she would be a little bit horrified mm -hmm. by yeah, <laughs> the yeah. state of things, <laughs> you know, and concerned, obviously, um, and probably really wondering how to get uh, people more invested in fact again, because she did believe that fact existed. I agree with everything that's been said, and I really appreciate it. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, one of the reasons Arendt, I, I believe, uh, didn't like the idea that people discussed social and, and economic issues in the public sphere is that they weren't opinions. They were actually things that were true or false, and that constrains the agon of the public sphere, which should just be about opinions, right? So I think she might want to revise that uh, to some extent. Uh, we're seeing the dark side of that now. I mean, if climate change is just an opinion, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's very common out here, people saying, do you believe in climate change? As if it's like, whether you believe in God or not. So I, I, yeah, I agree with you there. I think she'd find that appalling. And I also thought of the essay on authority in this context. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of what is wonderful about agonistic, spontaneous, uh, individuating political action depends on the existence of a pretty firm set of agreed upon values. And um, as I think I said in the paper that I did give you, uh, the reason that you know in the ancient Greek polis, the actor could uh, you know, reveal the who was because there wasn't any disagreement about what you were and what you were doing. And so the kind of so-called so pluralism that we have in the modern world is not like the pluralism that she's talking about. That's a plurality of individuals who have different points of view and different opinions, right? She says there's no such thing as public opinion. You know, only an individual can have an opinion. Um, the modern, the plurality we have in the modern world is radical moral pluralism. People have just radically different views about fundamental issues. And uh, that's something that, um, you know, one tries to counter that by getting people to appreciate the fact that we need some common institutions. If we don't have any common beliefs, we at least need some practices that we can execute in order to figure out how to live together. Once that disappears, uh, you know, who, who knows? Um, and, you know, Arendt was adamant that she, you know, she didn't have a theory from which you could deduce what to do politically. Uh, you've got to ask people who know about politics and who are involved. Please, let's thank uh, Professor Trevor Tears for having, writing this book and giving us the opportunity to be able to discuss and debate and, and give commentary and interpretation. And uh, also uh, to our audience here for being here. And uh, yeah, thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Dr. Karen Fry, as well as uh, Frederick uh, Dolan. Thank you so much. And Jennifer Gaffney as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you.